All right, welcome in everybody. Thank you guys for coming out to today's uh, program by the Queen's Historical Society. My name is Jaron Halfpath. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at the Queen's Historical Society. And QHS is dedicated to bringing you the culture and history of Queens. Part of that history is jazz. And with today's In Your Neighborhood program, we're going to explore the history and the techniques that make jazz special. We're going to be joined today by Phil Ballman, who is the Director of Cultural Affairs and Tourism for the Queensboro President, Donovan Richards, and is an internationally recognized performing arts professional with over two decades of experience as a drummer and percussionist, concert and event producer, entrepreneur, and educator. As a musician, Ballman is best known for his work, uh, his drum set work with the Grammy-nominated Afrobeat band Antibalas, and has performed, recorded, and toured with diverse artists such as uh, Cyro Baptista, uh, Baba Mala Mal, uh, the Manhattan Samba Group, Gamelan uh, Hanuman, Ang, uh, Fermi Kuti, and uh, the producer Tikla. And I'm sure Phil is going to uh, help correct me on the pronunciation of some of those. Um, but uh, welcome in, Phil. Thank you, Jaron. Hi, everybody. Thanks for spending part of your afternoon with us. Um, you know, you did pretty good. It's um, Ciro Baptista, who's a Brazilian percussionist, and Baba Mall, who's an African um, performer. And uh, Gamelan Hanumana Gung is a um, Gamelan... Uh, which is an Indonesian percussion orchestra. So uh, a little bit more about me um, and why I think uh, I have any right to give a presentation like this. Um, first of all, thanks to Queens Historical Society and Branca and um, Branca, excuse me, and Jaron and the whole team for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I am the Director of Cultural Affairs and Tourism for Borough President Richards, and prior to that role, I spent my professional career in music um, as a performer, as a drummer, um, starting with my love of jazz almost 40 years ago when I first uh, discovered it at age 12, so I'll let you do the math in terms of my age. Um, and uh, had a jazz radio show in college at WVFS in Florida State called Present Tense and uh, had guests like trombonist George Lewis and Wadada Leo Smith and Lawrence Butch Morris join us in uh, studio. I was a jazz buyer for Vinyl Fever Records in Tallahassee and worked for the Knitting Factory, which some of you may recall uh, when it was a downtown venue in Manhattan, not in its current incarnation as a uh, more of a rock club in Williamsburg and worked with them in, in Europe too, working with all kinds of musicians. And then just before I came to the borough president's office, I was at the new school for jazz and contemporary music uh, at the new school university in Manhattan. And I got to work closely with um, living legends of the music like Reggie Workman and Andrew Cyril and many, many others. So uh, I'm saying that because I'm not a historian. I'm not, um, really a jazz musician. The music I played is kind of jazz adjacent. But today we're going to talk about um, what is jazz? How can we describe it? And more, really more focused on the history of it. Um, because that question, what is jazz, is um, led to some very heated arguments over the years. Um, really, ever for a hundred years, um, people have been asking, what is it? Because um, jazz is a very hybrid form that absorbs new influences um, and it can mean different things to different people. And some folks like uh, Nicholas Payton and many other artists have a problem with the name in general and don't wanna call it jazz um, because it does have some associations that are um, could be considered derogatory. Um, Nicholas Payton would prefer to call it BAM, Black American Music. And so this is not the place for that debate. It's a good one and a worthy one. Um, but we're going to talk about what has become known as jazz, and uh, it was named the word of the century, 20th century, by the American Dialect Society, which is kind of amazing when it's, we don't really know for sure where the term originated. Um, uh, so dating back to 1860, there were, had been an African-American slang term, jasm, 
which means vim or energy. Um, on November 14th, 1916, the New Orleans Times Picayune newspaper referred for the first time to jazz bands, J-A-S. That's one of the first times, if not the first time it appeared in print. Again, a lot of this is lost in the mists of time. Uh, and that particular spelling could have come from that slang term. It could have referred to the jasmine perfume that prostitutes in New Orleans famed Storyville Red Light District wore um, uh, because jazz music did develop uh, in some ways in brothels and it was played in social places all over. Um, and musician Yubi Blake said in an interview with National Public Radio that when Broadway picked it up, they spelled it J-A-Z-Z. But it wasn't called that. It was spelled J-A-S-S, -S, and that was dirty. And if you knew what it was, you wouldn't say it in front of ladies. So that's what UB Blake said, and that's part of the reason why the term continues to be problematic, um, because it can be used as a way to pigeonhole or uh, perhaps diminish um, incredible artists who um, are, you know, deserving of the highest respect. Um, okay, so... Any conversation about the history of jazz has to start in New Orleans. Um, probably most of you know that already. Um, and that's because New Orleans is in many ways um, a Latin American city. And throughout the 1800s, you had this very unique mix of Spanish, French, English, Native American, Caribbean and African cultures there. Um, and it provided an incredible cultural complexity that provided early jazz with a wealth of inspirations. So um, that Caribbean flavor distinguished it from other North American cities. It was governed in turn by the Spanish from 1764 to 1800 and the French uh, from 1718 to 1764. And then again from 1800 to 1803. Um, and that brings us to the first important date in our timeline, which is the Louisiana Purchase when New Orleans became part of the United States. Um, but, you know, up until then, and even really to the current day, New Orleans is to some extent culturally and economically sim similar to Caribbean territories. And so the Gulf South's kind of um, alignment with um, the Caribbean also was very powerfully impacted by the Haitian Revolution. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I believe and others believe that the Haitian contribution is overlooked. Um, it has not been studied really in depth, um, but I'll make an argument that it's pretty powerful. Um, <clears throat> so this absorption of cultures uh, in the melting pot or gumbo, if you will, of New Orleans um, was kind of one of the most visible ways that you could see that kind of more laissez-faire attitude was in the fact that um, you know you had Sunday slave gatherings in Congo Square, um, where the slaves could and Africans could practice their art. But I'm getting ahead of myself first because uh, first I wanted to ask some musicians what they think jazz is, and then we'll go back to the story. So, Jaron, if you could pull up that clip of Charles Mingus, Charles Mingus, who was a Queens resident, um, let's see what he has to uh, answer to the question, what is jazz? Give me a sec, it's uh, not seeming to load on my phone. Okay, we may be having a little technical difficulty. Let me know when that's on. Uh, and then we'll hear from Duke Ellington who will speak what a little more expansively is? about that. And then we'll go back to the, um, to the conversation. Not yet. What is jazz music? All right, so I'll... Okay, I'll just keep going for a minute then. So jazz back music. to New Orleans, you know, one of the things about New Orleans was music? that um, jazz is an African-American art form and most associated with blacks, even though musicians working in New Orleans in the 19th century were of a very broad range of ethnic and social class backgrounds. You had New Orleans Francophones, French speakers, um, you had Spaniards, other Hispanics, Mexican, population, very large German and Italian population. You had, of course, people of African descent, slaves and their descendants and freed men and women, Native Americans and Creoles. And we'll talk a little bit about Creole. Um, Creoles were um, kind of a distinct 
group of persons in New Orleans who um, were kind of of mixed heritage. Um, do we, we're having trouble with the Charles Mingus? Okay. Okay, well, we'll get back to that, um, but it's a good one. I hope we can, I hope we can hear it. How's Duke? Can we play the Duke one first? Oh boy. Okay. So we're having a little technical difficulties with the media, but um, it's a good thing I have a lot of notes. All right. So let's get back to the story of New Orleans. Um, so you have the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And of course, after that, you had a large growth in the population. Um, and it kind of brings us back to Haiti. It's hard. I'm going to jump around in this story because as you can imagine, oh, we're good. We got it. Okay, great. Let's listen to Charles Mingus and then we'll get back to the narrative. What is jazz music? I don't know. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> So yeah, that's what Charles Mingus has to say. Um, let's listen to um, Duke Ellington, because again, you know, music is music to some extent, and we put it into these categories. But I think all the great jazz artists are really just musicians, and many of them, again, don't jazz necessarily music. like being called jazz musicians. Some have no problem with it. Let's see what Duke Ellington, uh, whose son Mercer Ellington, lived in Queens for many years. Has never-ending discussion. Uh, they have all sorts of thoughts about it from various people, some who know quite a bit about it and some who like to listen to it and others who are rather annoyed by it. And so it gives many, many points of view um, and the discussion is never finished. It's a very important subject. I, uh, when I was in Africa, in Senegal, I met uh, Papa Tao, a great Senegalese artist, and I was sort of giving him a theme on jazz because it's a constant question: what is jazz? What is jazz? And there's so many things. And I was busy ad-libbing this uh, sort of uh, extravagant picture of jazz, and I said, "Jazz is a tree, and it." Uh, has uh, many, many branches that reach out into many directions. Of course, it goes into the far east and picks up an exotic blossom. At the end of each branch is a twig, and at the end of each twig, there are many different shaped leaves and many vari-colored flowers, and, and it goes east, west, north, south, and everywhere. And everywhere it goes, it picks up some sort of certain influence. And if you uh, go back to the trunk, you'll find that it's probably a sort of transparent uh, bark, we could say, even made in Japan. And as it goes down into the deep roots that go way down into the earth, then you'll find out that these blue-blooded uh, black roots are deep in the soil of black Africa, which of course is the foundation of everything that is with the beat. The beat that, of course, today is the most listened to in the world. Okay, just done. All right. So that's what Duke Ellington has to say about the roots. And as we're about to get into, yes, the rhythmic root, particularly of jazz, is very much African. Um, okay, so so back to our timeline. We're around the time of the Louisiana Purchase, and when. Uh, Thomas Jefferson um, acquired the Louisiana Territory in 1803. New Orleans had already was already a century old Latin American city. And um, during this time, uh, there was an influx of many people, um, immigrants, including many musicians, such as the prominent family of Mexican American music teachers, the TOs, who taught many of the great jazz clarinetists. And at, during this time, Cuba was at the center of the Caribbean musical diffusion to Europe and the Americas. But also, in uh, we have to understand the role of Haiti because um, during the Haitian slave revolution and uprising in the 1790s, you had a mass exodus of people, uh, Africans, people of mixed blood, 
um, all kinds that fled from San Domingo is what it was known at the time before it was Haiti. Uh, they fled to Cuba. So estimates range from 10,000 to 30,000 people, who knows really, but it was a lot of people who left because of the instability. And then also a lot of people came over to New Orleans at that time because of the similarities. It was French speaking, had been French owned culturally. There were some similarities climate wise, there were some similarities. Um, and you know, the people who came from Santo Domingo or San Domingue um, remained in Cuba. And then when war erupted in the early 1800s between France and Spain, uh, they were forced again to seek refuge. And then uh, another wave of people came to New Orleans. So you have this, you have this influx of people from the Caribbean and from Haiti and from Cuba, bringing with them their culture. Um, so in 1800, the population of New Orleans was about 8,000. And by 1806, it had increased to 12,000. And by 1810, it was 24,000. So the city is booming. And included in this number were 3,000 free Blacks uh, refugees who fled New Orleans. And they brought them their, with them their French and Haitian and Creole, excuse me, and Cuban music traditions. So for example, French um, theater and light operas were very popular in New Orleans in the early and mid 1800s. Uh, and you had popular music forms of quadrilles and all kinds of things. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, uh, we're gonna get into a little musicology here, if you will. And we're, what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about um, the, rhythmic influences in jazz that we can trace uh, that came from Cuba, that came from Haiti, that can trace their roots back to Africa like Duke Ellington was talking about. And of those, there's three rhythms that are really important. Um, Jelly Roll Morton talked about jazz having the Spanish tinge and that's what made it distinctive. And that's what we're gonna talk about right now. What was that Spanish tinge? Um, and those were some rhythms called the habanera, the tresillo, and the cinquillo. And the tresillo is a rhythm that you all know. You may not know that you know it, but it is incredibly popular even to this day. And it kind of breaks down like. Your uh, microphone is cutting out for you, so I'm not sure if it, it thinks it's noise. Uh, it thinks it's noise. So, um, it's kind of like a, if anyone's heard reggaeton, if you know the Despacito rhythm, Despacito, da, 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 da. All right, so you have these rhythms that are coming in in the influx of cultures in New Orleans and influencing the musicians there. Um, and we see in these rhythms and also in what's known as the clave. And some of you who know about Cuban music or Latin music are familiar with the clave. It's an organizing a rhythmic principle of um, many kinds of Latin music all, and, and it's present in the earliest days in jazz. And how that's different is that um, you have this interplay which is very African in a, in a kind of, um, it's kind of a play between three and two, which is syncopated on the beat and off the beat. And you have this alternating, okay? So if we have, tell me, tell me if this, if you can hear this. It just cut out. Just cut out. All right, so if you have a four, four pulse, I was trying to play along. The clave would be one. So I'll try and count it and see if we can, we can understand that. One, two, three, four, five, can we hear that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we break that down, I, I'm, I'm happy that I did that. <laughs> I was trying to uh, click it, but I sang it. So in the first four beats there, we have three notes and it goes across. It doesn't lay squarely on the beat, right? And then in the second four beats, 
you have the two figure and that falls right on the dominant pulse, right? So it's this interplay between a triplet feel to use a musical term uh, and a straight on the beat, something syncopated and then it's answered with on the beat and then it goes off the beat. And this is very, very African. Um, and it's common in lots of musics, but we see it really for the first time in jazz in New Orleans. And so um, maybe we can play, let's play some examples now. This would be a good time to play some examples so you can hear what I'm talking about. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm skipping around because uh, I'm not used to this format. I hope you guys forgive me. And I realize the time is moving quick. Let's look at a quick map though of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. So we can just see really quick. So you can see how close everything is um, and why the, the interplay between these places was so, so strong. Um, why don't we play um, Salt Peanuts? We're gonna, before we play that though, remember this clave feeling, okay? It's one, two, three, one, two. Uh, 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 uh. That's what's known as the three, two clave. You can turn that around. It's two, three clave. There's son, there's rumba clave. There's all kinds of different claves. That's a whole other, you could write a, a, a doctoral dissertation on clave. So we don't have time for that, but let's play salt peanuts and listen for the clave in there. Obviously this is a little bit later. We're going to go back and we'll hear some earlier jazz, but this one is particularly strong. You can hear it. So let's play that. Salt peanuts, 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 salt peanuts. Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, how many people could hear the clave in there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be charitable and assume that was 
pretty much everybody could hear it. Um, and Dizzy Gillespie, of course, lived in Corona, several blocks away from Louis Armstrong. Uh, and of course, the Louis Armstrong House Museum is still there in Corona. I want to give a shout out to the House Museum and to Regina Bain and to the whole staff over there. Um, and uh, because of the pandemic, we can't visit now, but they will be open again soon. In the meantime, they have a lot of incredible content online. I urge you to check them out online. Uh, and um, so let's go back to, to, to New Orleans. So I, I'm realizing we're already halfway done. This is crazy. Um, so I'm going to speed it along, but there's a couple key dates that I want to flag in New Orleans. Then we're going to jump to New York. We're going to talk about some um, important figures in the development of jazz in general, but in particular to the history in New York. Uh, among them, Scott Joplin, who we heard, those of you who are in the waiting room, we heard Scott Joplin, who moved to New York in 1907. And we're going to talk about James Reese Europe, who is incredibly important and is um, woefully under-recognized for his massive contributions to American music, not just jazz, but all American music. Um, so let's go back to New Orleans, a couple key dates. So you had the um, Cotton Exposition in 1884. New Orleans hosted the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Exposition to publicize the city's recovery um, uh, after the Civil War. And it was held uptown at Audubon Park. And it had a lot of um, exhibits and halls that emphasized Louisiana's commercial and cultural ties to Latin America and the Caribbean. So the, at, at the expo, there was a number of contributions made to the development of jazz. Uh, Mexico's National Military Band played a repertoire that reinforced the Afro-Caribbean um, habanera rhythm in New Orleans music. And the habanera rhythm kind of goes like da 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 do da 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 do da 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 do da. Da, da, do. Um, and then after the expo, the uh, Junius Hart Music Company published its Mexican music series, which included the waltz Sobre las Olas, which evolved into the New Orleans jazz fox top, foxtrot standard over the waves. And then in another development, you had Papa Jack Lane, who mentored many early jazz musicians in his Reliance Brass Band, and he began his professional music career by playing at the expo. Now, the next thing we have to talk about in the development of jazz um, in New Orleans is Plessy versus Ferguson, which was, of course, the landmark uh, Supreme Court ruling in 1896. And they considered the constitutionality of a Louisiana law that was passed in 1890 that provided for separate railway carriages for the white and colored races, the separate but equal doctrine. So Homer Plessy, the plaintiff in the case, was um, seven eighths white and one eighth black. Uh, and he, on June 7th, 1892, he purchased a first class ticket for a trip between New Orleans and Covington, Louisiana. And he sat in a empty seat in the whites only section. And he was arrested and imprisoned and brought to trial and convicted of violating this 1890 law. Um, he filed a petition and um, the Louisiana Supreme Court argued that the segregation law violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, the court ruled, though, that while the object of the 14th Amendment was to create absolute equality of the two races before the law, such equality extended only so far as political and civil rights, i.e. voting and serving on juries, and not social rights. So that established the separate but equal. So why is that important in the history of jazz? Because at that time you had this large Creole or kind of mixed population who were distinct and separate from blacks. And the Creoles um, did not equate themselves at that time with blacks. They spoke a different language in many cases and came from a different cultural background. Some had been slave owners themselves. But in the wake of this law, if you had any colored blood, you were considered black. And so that meant that the Creoles who had kind of existed in something of a semi-autonomous cultural space were by white mainstream society lumped in with the blacks. All right. Um, so it has been said that New Orleans jazz resulted from this juxtaposition of Creoles um, musicianship and the freed slaves passion and feeling. So downtown in New Orleans, is um, where you had a lot of the um, Africans and slaves um, 
and many of them had uh, were uh, learned by ear or had their folkloric rhythms that they that they had carried with them culturally, uh, and different influences from Caribbean Creole culture, and of course it was all mixed. There was no hard demarcation between uptown and downtown between Creole and Black. But just for sake of this discussion, we're going to talk about it like that. Um, Creoles had um, often sophisticated training, um, uh, were uh, formally educated, maintained a Creole identity with a French-speaking Catholic culture, um, tended to more embrace Western music traditions such as opera, classical, and military parade marches. And following emancipation in 1863, newly freed Black people made every attempt to gain social mobility while the free um, people of color generally sought to maintain their separate social institutions and their elevated educational and social achievements. And then the Black musicians uptown, I think I got that wrong. I think I said the Creoles were uptown, sorry. Uh, uh, not a New Orleans person, so don't kill me in the comments if I got that wrong. But the black musicians were uptown, the Creoles were downtown. Um, upriver from Canal Street is uptown in New Orleans. They were more likely to be Protestant, more likely to learn by ear, known for playing improvised blues and ragtime. And many early jazz musicians from uptown, including Joe Oliver, Louis Armstrong, and Johnny and Baby Dodds, were descendants of enslaved people from the city and the surrounding rural areas. So, um, Many of the early downtown players, including Jelly Roll Morton, who was a uh, Creole, Sidney Bechet and Freddie Keppard were attracted to the quote unquote rougher uptown style of playing. Um, and again, these communities were not monolithic. Uptown was also home to educated musicians, including professors John Robichaud and uh, James Humphreys and Louis Armstrong also had some formal training. But as a, as a, as a way of conceiving it, it was this Plessy versus Ferguson ruling really basically what it had the result of these different communities had to integrate more than ever musically. And this was one of the early kind of things that stimulated jazz. So um, let me just check my timeline and see where we're at. Okay. So now one of the problems that we run into when we're trying to figure out what is jazz, how did jazz form? When did it start is a lot of the early examples weren't recorded. You've probably heard of Buddy Bolden, right? Um, a legendary figure who was never recorded because he was living prior to recording technology. Uh, or if there was recording technology, it was incredibly primitive. And at any rate, he never was recorded. Um, so uh, let me find my notes here. So everyone in his band um, was playing by ear. They weren't reading music. Um, but there's something, there's an interesting performance that Buddy Bolden did that goes into the next thing in our timeline, which is the Spanish-American War. Um, and then pretty, don't worry, we're gonna get to New York pretty soon, okay? But let's go back. Spanish-American War was in 1898. America goes to war with Spain uh, over Cuba, kicks them out of Cuba. We also fight the Spanish in the Philippines and the Philippines becomes a territory. Um, and, Buddy Bolden, at one of the first public performances of his group, was in 1898, and Buddy Bolden chose to play Home Sweet Home at a send-off of American troops bound for Cuba during the Spanish-American War. And this sentimental song nearly sparked a mutiny by the troops who were reminded of their destination and the fact that some of them never returned to the United States. And actually, from that point on, Home Sweet Home was banned as a performance at any military war zone send-off. So we're already seeing how powerful this music was rhythmically, how exciting it was. And it really got people um, really, really excited. With the notoriety of that incident, Buddy Bolden's band soon became enormously popular in New Orleans and across the South. Um, and band members became noted for their improvised performances. Um, Buddy Bolden, you know, he, it, fame was difficult for him and he it took a toll on, on him, he became an alcoholic and uh, unfortunately lost his um, position as band leader and had mental illnesses, even schizophrenia, and, and uh, was confined at age 29 to the East Louisiana State Hospital in Jackson and died um, 24 years later in that institution at the age of 54, a tragic story. Um, so 
Sorry, I have so many notes that I'm just checking where we are. So, okay, that kind of, let's talk about brass bands because that was another really important um, influence on the early um, development of jazz, okay? So I touched very briefly on Congo Square. This was a really important place because the um, most places in the United States outlawed slaves or freed blacks from playing their rhythms because like in Virginia, the slave owners in particular were afraid, particularly after the Haitian revolution, they were afraid that the, they were using these drums to say, you know, let's rise up and, you know, have an uprising because in some West African cultures, like in Yoruba, in present day Nigeria, the drums are quote unquote talking because Yoruba is a tone language and the drums can replicate that language. But in New Orleans, Sunday was a day off and they allowed the slaves and the blacks to play their rhythms in Congo Square. So some people would say, oh, Congo Square is the birth of jazz. Not really, but the fact that those rhythms could be played openly and those um, traditions could be kept alive was really significant. And then the, the, so back to the brass bands, the other, um, this is a really important tradition that gave us kind of the instrumentation that we think of when we think of jazz, right? Um, we have horns, we have drums, it's a marching music. Um, this tradition developed from the Turkish influenced European military bands of the late 18th century. And in New Orleans, these bands played, um, served functions as marching and parades. They played for political rallies, funerals, celebrations and dance parties. And their repertoire included marches constructed from popular music of the day, such as the tango, Panama, and La Trocha, which included a habanera or habanera bass accompanied. Both were by the composer William Tyres. And to make the music danceable, the melody ornamented and the rhythm was syncopated or swung. We'll go back to that clave, that three versus two feeling on the beat and off the beat. And that creates a really exciting rhythmic tension that most of us are familiar with from all other kinds of music, but we really see it early on in jazz um, and it's really important. So this swinging syncopation may be the precursor of what became known as swing in jazz, right? So um, probably some of you have heard of the second line in New Orleans um, and that was a brass band and is to this day a brass band tradition um, and like we just learned, these brass bands would, would perform at funerals and other functions. So we're going to listen to Alan Toussaint talk about the second line. Um, and this is, a film, ah. but this is from a fantastic film that I urge you to check out. It's called Always for Pleasure by uh, Les Blank in 1978. Ah. 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 Second line bands, the bands that march in the street, uh, initially was done for funerals. Maybe even before that for something else, but by the time we can uh, talk about it, this is what I know about it, was done for funerals, to march real slow on the way to the funeral and cut up on the way back. That's how you lay the dead away with a band. You take them on out and you boogie back. And the people who are behind the band and doing their things is the second line.
So that was the legendary New Orleans um, composer and band leader and pianist, Alan Toussaint. Um, so we still haven't made it to the first jazz recording, which happened in 1917, but I'm gonna bring the conversation now. We could talk about New Orleans all day, um, but we've only got 20 minutes left. So um, we're gonna talk about sort of, you know, before what we recognize as quote unquote jazz, again, recognizing how difficult it is to pin that down, there was a transitory kind of transitional form that became uh, known as ragtime, uh, incredibly popular music. And the king of ragtime was Scott Joplin, who um, moved to New York in 1907. Um, hold on, let me find it. Here we go. He moved here um, in 1907 from St. Louis, and um, he had a huge hit called Maple Leaf Rag that, again, we listened to. Um, in those who came early, it was in the waiting room. And in a minute, we'll play um, Jelly Roll Morton, New Orleans Creole musician's version of Maple Leaf Rag. But that was the first ragtime hit. And he also had written The Entertainer, which decades later um, was in the Oscar winning movie, The Sting. And that's where many people, there was a resurgence of interest in Scott Joplin. Um, his time in New York was immensely productive and he published 25 of his 53 works, including three significant rags, Wall Street, Pineapple, and Magnetic. And he wrote his 1911 opera, Tremonisha in Harlem. And its theme was the salvation of um, African-American race through education, but that was a tough sell at the time. And nobody, he couldn't get anybody interested in it. Even Irving Berlin turned him down. Although Joplin later accused um, Berlin of, of stealing a melody from the opera for Berlin's hit, Alexander's Ragtime Band, um, that was never proved. So there were a few performances of Tremonisha, but it was very difficult period for Scott Joplin. Um, it, it was not a success. He spent a lot of his money that he had made from these hits um, producing Tremonisha. Um, he developed dementia and he died at age 49, tragically. And he is buried in an unmarked community grave, or was, it's now marked, but at the time it was an unmarked grave in St. Michael's Cemetery in East Elmhurst, Queens. I'm in Jackson Heights right now, so this is right around the corner from me. And uh, in, finally, in 1974, ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, placed a plaque at the grave site. Um, can we, let's see a picture of Scott Joplin. This is from 1911, around the time that he wrote Tremonisha. Not gonna. You've probably seen it. And if we can get that, that's great. And then if we can, let's, we'll see a picture of the plaque. Uh, I believe that the first, yeah, okay, good. I believe that the first plaque had uh, a, a mistake and then it was later replaced. But amazingly, there's nothing else physical left of Scott Joplin's legacy. His papers were destroyed in the early 60s. And here he is, this legend of music, American music, uh, you know, who was forgotten for decades. And thankfully, people are aware that that um, is there. If you want to go to St. Michael's, it's in East Elmhurst, I urge you to, to visit. All right. Um, why don't we listen to, um, how long is the, uh, I think, um, I don't remember if I okay. Let's let's play um Jelly Roll Morton's version of um Maple Leaf Rag. And when we're listening to that, again, listen for those syncopated rhythms um that are so distinctive and that we first really see crystallizing in ragtime. And then when you hear people refer to jazzing something up, a lot of times it implied adding this rhythmic complexity and sophistication and syncopated feeling to it. Let's take a listen to that.
Okay. Great. So that was um, Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag performed by Jelly Roll Morton. So we can hear um, the syncopation that I was talking about in that melody. So European marches, um, the rhythm tends to be more, again, on the beat. So if you have two bars counted in four, which would be eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in a European kind of rhythmic way, that's broken more most often into two, four, very even subdivisions. But a very African subdivision, um, such as we hear in the maple leaf rag, would be that eight is broken into three plus three plus two. And so that gives you that kind of ambiguity of rhythm. And that's a joke if you ask people who play African diaspora music, like, where's the one? Because sometimes it's hard to tell because the beats can feel flipped around. Um, and many of you, have, I'm sure all of you have experienced that as a listener and you feel that excitement of when a beat drops on an unexpected place. And it's, um, it's a very African thing. So, and you know, many scholars and jazz musicians believe that the rhythms in jazz are African. Uh, this is not a controversial thing to say. Gunther Schuller in 1968, he noted similarities of the West African Gankogui drum pattern to the Charleston. Um, and the Gankogui pattern is a three plus three plus two pattern. And it's identical to the Tresillo rhythm, which we talked about before, which comes through Cuba and maybe through Haiti, uh, definitely through Haiti, but also from Africa. Um, and the Tresillo rhythm is again, uh, 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 that Ed Sheeran song, right? There's the Tracio rhythm right there. Um, so Benny Powell, who was trombonist with the um, Count Basie Orchestra and Count Basie, of course, famous resident of Queens, um, he provided a performer's perspective on this. So talking about the um, improvising background figures behind soloists, um, he said in 1995, Benny Powell in an interview said that the rhythms we played during the riffs were African. That is what's African about the music. They came from Africa. So, you know, Count Basie was a band that was known for what is called a head arrangement where you have a riff and then the musician or the head, the main melody typically. And then the musicians collectively will improvise an arrangement and when there's a soloist playing, they'll improvise a backing line behind. And so Benny Powell's talking about these rhythmic cells that they invented on the fly had an African feel, again, in that three and two kind of feel. Um, so I think we have a little bit of time. So, you know, we'll keep going back and forth between that. And when we get to the Q&A section, if anybody has questions, I'll do my best to um, to answer them. Let's go back to New York. We still haven't gotten to the first jazz recording in 1917, but first we have to talk about James Reese Europe. So just like Scott Joplin was a really important figure in the kind of pre-jazz era and kind of um, was a transitional figure from ragtime into jazz, James Reese Europe was um, hugely important. He was um, classically trained and came to New York hoping to have a classical career. But because of uh, you know, the discrimination against blacks, it was impossible um, for him. And this happened you know, many times. This is one of the you know, sad aspects of the history of jazz was that you had other very highly trained and skilled and sophisticated musicians. Will Marion Cook is another one um, in Washington DC who was a mentor to um, uh, Duke Ellington was a known composer in his own right. And it was difficult for them to have a success in kind of Western classical music because of discrimination. Um, UB Blake said of James Reese Europe, he was our, uh, the, Bene the Martin Luther King of music, benefactor and inspiration. Um, so he was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1881. In 1904, moved to New York City. Um, and in 1910, he formed the Clef Club. And let's see if we can have a picture of the Clef Club, the first concert, 1910. 
Now, what was really important and interesting about the Clef Club was that this was an organization that not only put together its own orchestra and chorus, but served as a union and a contracting agency for Black musicians. This is really critical. So James Reese Europe was also a very savvy leader um, and businessman, and the Clef Club Orchestra became tremendously popular. And he had many orchestras, and they would be playing at multiple dates throughout the city, and James Reese Europe would go and make appearances at all of them. Um, very popular. And he put together, uh, on May 2nd, 1912, the Clef Club Symphony Orchestra put on a concert of Negro music in Carnegie Hall, which was a massive success. And it was a 125 man orchestra. And in this way, James Reese Europe was the godfather of the big band in jazz, which of course later became hugely popular in the middle of the 20th century and was the predominant form of jazz after early jazz. Then you got into big bands and swing. Um, in the 30s and 40s. And Duke Ellington kept his band alive all the way until the end, even though it was very difficult for him to do so. Um, so Europe believed that although black musicians respected white music of quality, they didn't need to play or imitate it. And they had their own music to play that all races of people would wanna hear. And so that orchestra that he had at Carding Hall was a very distinctive and unusual uh, instrumentation, had a lot of banjos had other, um, and mandolins, and it, it was music by exclusively black composers. So Europe left the Clef Club in 1913 and formed another organization, the Tempo Club. And this new club served kind of the same purpose, which was to book black musicians for the dances which were sweeping New York City. Um, and we're gonna play a quick clip of, uh, about James Reese Europe, and then we'll listen to one of his tunes. But first I wanna tell you about his association with the popular dancing duo, Vernon and Irene Castle. Can we see the picture of the uh, castles? So Europe invented the turkey trot with the castles and the foxtrot, which is still popular today. Um, so then what happened, you would expect James Reese Europe to just kind of, he made a series of recordings in 1914 for the Victor Record Company and it show, it, we'll listen to one and you'll see that the music is utterly unique and like nothing before or really after. It's not jazz or ragtime. It's kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, its own unique amalgam. But World War I was happening and James Europe signed up and was commissioned as a lieutenant for the 15th Regiment uh, in Harlem under Colonel Hayward. He was ordered to put together a band, the best band he could muster, and he did, and he um, went as far afield as Puerto Rico to get the musicians he wanted. And his friend Noble Sissel served as his drum major. Noble Sissel is another important early figure in jazz who's um, a little bit under-recognized for his contributions, vocalist and um, uh, musician. And this regiment became known as the 369th. And this uh, unit, was um, really important in the early spread of jazz because this regiment was known as the Hellfighters and um, they were sent to Europe, but the Americans didn't, you know, there was issues with the whites didn't wanna fight alongside blacks. They kind of gave the regiment to the French. The French put them into battle um, and they were one of the most highly decorated units in the war. James Reese Europe was a war hero. Um, and that alone would assure his place in history. But also really important was that this incredible band that he put together, they're in France and they performed all over France and it blew people's minds. They would play the Marseillaise and at first the audiences, they didn't recognize it. And then when they recognized it, they went insane because they were playing these syncopated rhythms and kind of jazz-like rhythms. And people actually went up to the musicians and asked if they were trick instruments. They thought there was something special about their instruments. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Um, and we can, to this day, the French are, you know, stereotype of like, oh, the French love jazz. Well, that's where it comes from, is, is James Reese Europe and the Hellfighters, the 369th, in Europe um, 
And when they came back, they um, were given a hero's welcome. There was a ticker tape parade down Broadway in New York City. Huge, huge, huge turnout. Uh, and then James Reese Europe went on a tour with his band all over the United States, further spreading this kind of new style of music that, again, was kind of a precursor to jazz um, and really built up a huge audience for this type of um, material, right? Sadly, he um, was about to embark on a tour with his Hellfighters band and played a show in New York. And then just before the next show in Boston, he was knifed in the neck by a drummer in his band, Herbert Wright, um, who, you know, he thought Europe had cheated him. And it looked like a small wound and Europe asked Noble Sissel to carry on in his stead while he went to the hospital, but the wound actually was fatal and he died an hour later, uh, a relatively young, young man. I think he was 39 or maybe 40 years old. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna, watch this brief, uh, there's a trailer. This movie was supposed to come out. I don't know if it came out, but this is kind of a good nutshell. We'll watch this for a few minutes. And I think we have some time. We'll go over a little bit over the hour. That's okay, Jaron. Uh, and then we're gonna continue the story of jazz in New York and particularly in Queens. Now we're gonna bring it home to Queens uh, after we talk about James Reese. Come jazzers, gather round Jazz lovers from every town I've got something that I'd like to introduce you to It's new It's got a funny name That's going to win its fame With your kind attention I will mention its many charms to you They call it jazz Hold up. Nobody knows it's originated. Jazz, hola. It's just a dance full of syncopation. And if you crave a new sensation, come with me, you will see strange sights from the land of harmony. Old folks and young folks cry for jazz, hola. It's like a tonic taken with you. How could you feel? My old friend had heard the news. Swap his cane for dancing to the whole world crazy of the jazz. Oh, There's a minute bus a coming. Look out. Hear that roar. There's one more. And that, but there's a very light. Don't gasp for to find you all right. Don't start to bumming with those hand grenades. There's a machine gun, the holy space. Alert, gas, put on your mask. Adjust it correctly and hurry up fast. Drop, there's a rocket for the fight barrage. Down, hug the ground, push your can, don't stand. Creep and crawl, follow me, that's all. What do you hear? Nothing near, don't fear, all clear. That's the life of a soul when you take a patrol. Out in no man's land, ain't a grand. Out in no man's land. There's the life of a soul when you take a patrol. Out in no man's land, ain't a grand. Out in no man's land. All of no man's land is our dear. Now I have come back home to you, my honey crew. Wedding bells in June, June. All will sail by the June, June. And victory's won, the war is over. The whole wide world is a region clover. And hand in hand, we'll go through life, yeah. Just see how happy we will be. I mean, we three, we'll pick a bungalow among the fragrant boughs and spend a honeymoon with the blooming flowers. All of no man's land is ours. So that, there you go. that's kind of a quick um, overview of James Reese Europe. Uh, in that trailer, they refer to it as the 15th um, Regiment. It later became known as the 369th, in case you're confused by that discrepancy. Um, okay, so 
James Reese Europe came back in 1919, had died. And by then we had the first jazz recording. 1917, it was recorded in New York City. Uh, and probably not a huge surprise, it was a white band, the original uh, Dixieland jazz band. And they recorded Livery Stable Blues for Victor Records here in, in uh, New York in February 1917. It is considered the first jazz recording. It was an immediate hit and sold over uh, a million copies. So now we're, we're getting into the kind of heart of the story. And New York at that time was already uh, becoming a center for the performance of jazz. Um, Queens was not really a major center for the performance of jazz, but Queens, some of you probably already know, um, was, uh, became the place where many, many, many prominent jazz artists and black um, entertainers and, and uh, business people and athletes and prominent figures uh, in all fields came to live in Queens. But talking about music, probably the, be the earliest we can trace back the growth of that um, community here in Queens is um, to 1923, when music publisher Clarence Williams and his wife, uh, singer Eva Taylor, they purchased a home on 108th Avenue in Jamaica. And Williams grew up in the countryside in Louisiana, and he didn't want a home in Harlem or Greenwich Village, which, you know, were urban. You had to live in an apartment. And you had Sugar Hill at the time, which was home to many prominent um, African-Americans. Duke Ellington lived there. Other people lived there. But more and more, I think uh, people wanted to um, have some place to maybe retreat from the limelight, have a, a large home and yards for their kids to grow up. Um, and so Clarence Williams wanted to create a community of black musicians in Queens. And at, this was at a time when there were a few hotels for African-Americans. You couldn't stay in places. So many out of town musicians, when they were in New York, they would stay with the Williams family in Queens. Uh, among them, Willie the Lion Smith, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and Louis Armstrong probably got his first exposure to Queens visiting Williams. Um, and then later on, you had um, Fats Waller, who came to the neighborhood um, in the 1930s. And to be specific, the neighborhood that I'm talking about, and there, we're going to look at the Queens Jazz Trail map in a minute, but um, one neighborhood stands out, and that is Addisley Park in St. Albans, which was um, designated, it was known as the Black Hollywood East, and it was designated a historic district by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, so Fats Waller came to the neighborhood in the 30s, and other entertainers followed his lead, including Count Basie, who held legendary pool parties at his home with his wife, Catherine, Duke Ellington's son and band leader, Mercer Ellington, and other jazz greats, uh, including Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Lena Horne, uh, Brooke Benton, Godfather of Soul, James Brown lived there in the 60s and the 70s, and he built a moat around his home. It's pretty cool. Um, that was one of the first suburban style neighborhoods where black people could live in New York City. Um, and it was really important because in the 19, you know, in, in, in the early part of the century, black people were um, discriminated against and couldn't purchase homes in any place that they wanted to. So this was one of the first kind of places that um, offered African Americans that opportunity to share in the so called American dream of a home in a yard. Um, and Later, the, the Supreme Court ruled the restrictive covenants unconstitutional. I think that was in 1948. Um, that was that lifted a legal barrier to equal opportunity for blacks in housing. But unfortunately, there are still to this day um, issues. And there, you know, that's again, another another conversation. So let's take a look at the Queens Jazz Trail map. This was made by Flushing Town Hall. Shout out to Flushing Town Hall. Um, jazz is still performed at Flushing Town Hall. And like so many of our institutions, they have been closed because of the pandemic, but tons of programming online. Please check them out online, Flushing Town Hall. Um, also Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, JCAL in Jamaica, close to um, St. Albans. Has lots of programming online. So if we look at the Jazz Trail map, you can see this is a fantastic map. It's unfortunately out of print, 
but we're working to get it reprinted. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, you can see how many incredible people lived here. You know, there were some other amazing moments in Queens. There was uh, a, a, an evening in the 1930s when Benny Goodman first jammed with pianist Teddy Wilson at a party in Forest Hills at the home of Red Norvo and Mildred Bailey. And the Benny Goodman trio was birthed that night. And that was one of the first and the most historic racially integrated groups to play in public. And there had been integrated after hours jams for years before, but that um, the genesis of that very important group was right here in Queens in Forest Hills. So a quick list of some of the famous musicians who have lived in Queens, Louis Armstrong, of course, again, please visit the Louis Armstrong House Museum. It's an incredible um, institution. They're building a wonderful education center across the street from the home. Uh, that's gonna have a small performance space. Um, look for that in the next few years. Dizzy Gillespie lived around the corner in Corona. The two were friends. There was some talk that they were, you know, rivals and Dizzy thought that, you know, Louis Armstrong was old school and, you know, Dizzy was this radical, but they were close friends. Um, and actually, parenthetically, let me talk quickly before I go on about um, Dizzy Gillespie also was really well known for bringing Chano Pozo from Cuba to play in his band. So you had this sort of second wave of Latin influence in jazz. But again, these rhythms, the clave, tresillo, um, cinquillo, um, uh, they're, uh, the, the habanera, they're kind of baked into the DNA of jazz. So when Chano Pozo came and played with Dizzy, it, it, it fit right away. And at the same time, you had other people like, um, let me find my notes, with, um, you had, um, I'll find it. Naturally, I can't find it right when I need it. Um, oh, here it is, sorry. Uh, Mario Bauza, the Cuban trumpeter played with Cap Calloway. Um, Juan Tizol played with Duke Ellington, the Puerto Rican trombonist who wrote Caravan, one of the Duke Ellington Orchestra's most famous compositions. Max Roach, the um, incredible drummer um, from Brooklyn, gives credit to Machito, a Latin percussionist, for revolutionizing his approach to drum set, which is an American 20th century invention. And so by combining the percussion instruments that you may see in a, a Latin kind of setting, you have the bell and conga and different instruments, he put those rhythms into the drum set and revolutionized jazz drumming. Um, but let's go back to the list. So John Coltrane lived in Queens, Count Basie, Milt Hinton, Big Spiderbeck, early uh, jazz trumpeter. Tony Bennett, of course. Fats Waller, Billy Holiday, uh, Illinois Jacket, Jimmy Heath, Percy Heath, um, Nat Adderley and Cannonball Adderley, Charles Mingus, who we saw earlier in the program, James P. Johnson, Roy Eldridge, Clark Terry, Jimmy Rushing, Woody Herman, Lenny Tristano, um, Glenn Miller, Junior Mance, who I had the pleasure of getting to know when I was at the new school. Um, and there's, there's many, many more. So, okay, we ran over a little bit and I'm amazed that I got in as much as I could in an hour and change. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me to put this together. Uh, thanks again to Queens Historical Society and Jaron and Bronca and everybody over there. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them or chat. Okay, thank you, Phil, for uh, giving this this wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, we do have one question here. Um, how has uh, jazz's structure been influenced by uh, its medium uh, having changed? Uh, you mentioned the invention of recording and how uh, in 1917 there was the first uh, jazz recording. How did the recording industry change uh, and also broadcast in general as people uh, got radios. Uh, how, how do you think that that has influenced jazz's uh, both appeal and its own structure? Uh, that's a good question and a, a, a complicated answer. Um, 
you know, the music was popular right away and you had uh, imitators and um, people who were not of the community, like the, you know, and there's a lot of controversy around the original Dixieland jazz band, um, but it became clear that there was a market for this kind of music. Um, and so there were labels that sprung up to take advantage of this. Um, and, you know, one of the issues and an ongoing issue throughout the 20th century and even into today is um, who owns the intellectual property, who owns the publishing, the recording industry history is rife with examples of um, all artists, but particularly African-American artists who were taken advantage of, frankly, um, or weren't given an opportunity unless they gave up some of their rights. Um, so to answer the question, the, the rise of records, you know, became huge because that's what really spread jazz. Um, and uh, became hugely popular. We had the, the jazz age, right, in the 20s. Then uh, it continued and into the 30s, jazz was extremely popular and you had many dance bands. There were many dance bands in New York, uptown, in Harlem, um, nationwide. And then there was a bit of a pause during World War II when um, the materials that you used to make vinyl records were, um, there was like an embargo on making them because they were used for the war effort. So that was a difficult time. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for the big bands. And you saw a move to smaller groups because it was more economically viable. And then as that changed and jazz became less of a dance music, we see, you know, I talked about some of these rhythms kind of as a pedagogical way to talk about the music but they become less and less um, obviously prominent as the music shifts and becomes less associated with dancing. And you had, we, we've talked about Dizzy, and he of course was known uh, as one of the progenitors of what became known as bebop. Also Thelonious Monk was an important creator of that. And what was interesting about this development of jazz was it was perhaps the first movement in the music that was self-consciously intellectual and the idea was, why shouldn't this music be taken as seriously as any other great art music compositionally? So um, it's a fast paced music. It's not geared for dancing per se, although you certainly could dance to it, but it's not dance music per se. And it was much more about the intellectual, like um, uh, kind of delight and surprise of the structures of the music and the way they're moving through the chord changes and the harmony and the, the melody. Um, still jazz continue to be popular uh, relatively as a recording kind of, you know, on records. Through the 50s, a lot of people point to 1959 as kind of like the end of kind of the jazz era of really successful jazz records, although it still continues. But like 1959, kind of blue to this day, this, the biggest selling jazz album was made in 1959, so long ago. But um, and then in, in, in the 60s and 70s, as newer musics came along, jazz started to become seen as kind of like old hat or, you know, just appealing to a niche. So in the current day, jazz recordings, it's a very small percentage of total number of units that are sold in the recording industry. It's like, I hate to say it, but it's like 1%, a couple percent, you know. Um, but the good news is that jazz remains alive and well. There are many, many people playing it uh, all over the world. And again, that's one of the things that Duke pointed to at the beginning of the thing is that um, it's so hard to say what jazz is because it's uh, it was a form that was born of like, a, an amalgam of different influences. It's a synergistic form and it takes on new influences all the time and it continues to do so. And there are people making exciting new sounds, you know, to this day. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Um, that actually leads into a, a, another question, which is uh, are there any contemporary jazz musicians of Queens that uh, you think we should know about? I mean, yes, there are lots. There are lots of them, and I don't know all of them. Um, 
but uh, I can just think off the top of my head of a couple people um, in our in our neighborhood, in my neighborhood here in Jackson Heights. There's um, uh, um, vocalist Tana Alexa, um, and her husband uh, Antonio Sanchez, who's a multiple. Grammy award-winning drummer, Antonio Sanchez, played with Pat Metheny and with many, many, many people. He's fantastic. He lives right here in Queens. Um, and now, I'm again, don't kill me in the comments if I forgot other people who live in Queens. It's um, a lot. You know, there's there are, yes. To answer your question, yes, there are. And I'm sorry, I don't know all of them. Those That's are just okay. that kind of come to the top of my head. And... Uh... I think that's all of the questions that we have for today, but uh, where can people reach you if they have uh, more questions that they'd like to follow up with? Um, can I just put my email in the chat? Sure. I'll uh, copy and paste it into the YouTube chat. Okay. I'll give you my work email address. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Hope you enjoyed it. I had a good time. It was really fun for me to do the, some research and to, uh, I learned a bunch and um, listen to a bunch of cool music. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Um, and if anybody wants to see any more of Queens Historical Society's uh, other programs, we have more coming up later on uh, next week. We have a program with Vishnu Shudar, um, a uh, Queens-born engineer who uh, worked with the NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to help make the camera that went to the um, on the Mars rover. Uh, so if you have any questions that you want to ask, um, we're going to be doing a Q&A session with him then, so just go to our website and you can submit questions there. And then on April 10th, we'll be having our airfare program where we're going to be talking about the history of airports in Queens and the six different airports that Queens has had. Um, you can find all of that information and how to join uh, our um, our mission and become a member of Queens Historical Society by going to our website. Uh, I've pasted it into chat. Um, and there you'll be able to find uh, a recording of this program and other programs that we've had as well. So thank you guys for all coming out, and thank you once again, Phil, for spending your, uh, your afternoon with us today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Have a good one, everybody.